if you picture Patagonia 18,000 years ago, this whole area was covered by a massive contiguous ice sheet. And now that former glacial expanse has been separated into two relatively small, but by world standards still enormous, ice caps called the Northern Patagonian and the Southern Patagonian ice fields. And my work for the past few years has brought me around the edge of the Northern Patagonian ice field, which I think is probably the most beautiful place in the world and is extremely unexplored. And I remember the first time I was caretaking a remote ranch and the Colonia Valley, which is on the eastern side of the northern ice field. And on bluebird days, you could look across Lago Colonia and look up past Cerro Arenales and see these distant white triangles. And those white triangles were the Isen Range, basically on the western edge of the northern ice field. stare into the camera. Like, <laughs> Izzy, as a resident person who's been to the ice field before, do you have any advice? Uh, <laughs> bring, bring goggles. <laughs> <laughs> nice fish. Look at it. If I do say so myself. <laughs> See you later, buddy. Good luck. It was just insane. There were so many moving pieces to this thing. It was so hilarious and awesome. To even like, our part of it was huge, like carrying sleds on an unsupported expedition across a massive ice field, but there are so many crazy, fun, moving parts at either end of it. I'm just detuning the skis so Ben can shred it on these silhouettes. <laughs> <laughs> It's gonna be hard to pack the bikes onto the ice field, but <laughs> they look really good. That one's yeah. called the Grand Teton, so. The 1980s bikes. Yeah. Ben left this cheese in the car, and when I got to it, it was really squishy, so hopefully it'll be okay. No one does this. It's a very old school type of aspiration in that we were trying to be fully self-supported. We were trying to carry 25 days of food and fuel we were trying to carry skis, sleds, rock climbing equipment, ice climbing equipment, snow climbing equipment, and glacial travel equipment, and basically lug it into the, one of the most remote places on Earth that is notorious for its weather, and then cross our fingers and hope for the opportunity to climb something. <laughs> places like that you drive to an airport and you fly in a bush plane because that scene is so well set up and it the scale of distance and peaks is pretty similar to Alaska really in Patagonia but there's just no infrastructure so you kind of have to figure out all those little logistical pieces yourself and Ben is the logistics master and has lived down here speaks perfect Spanish knows all the gauchos and had everything all set up for us 
We took a jet boat up a river. We shuttled loads to a lake, this lake with giant chunks of ice floating in it. We took a boat across the lake. We shuttled gear. No more Doris. Legs Wilcox. Steam oh god, there's just steam everywhere now. You can't see anything. Why did this happen suddenly? It's the sauna. Everyone ate a block of cheese. Now the metabolism's going to work. We are real wet though. I have to tell you. But it's about to be dry town in here. Well <laughs> it's some of these things I don't think are ever gonna be dry. No. Now. the head torches. We are heading out into the night to sledge, to sledge the night away. What's a you get One of us is a little more ready than the rest of us. <laughs> I've been getting ready. Here. Going downhill on the sleds is absolutely awful. Like the worst thing ever. The sled slides behind you and hits you in the back of the feet and knocks you over. You fall into a crevasse and the sled comes sliding behind you and hits you in the back of the head. It was just terrible. <laughs> it's working! Well, can't see shit, but that's not. We got our first glimpses of where we're going. This is an all-time high for the <laughs> RV. <laughs> 
<laughs> of the Isen range. <laughs> Most we've seen the whole trip. Yeah, it looks good. <laughs> How many days have we been sledging? What sledge day is today? Wow. Uh, three, five, five. Today is day five of pulling sled across. I think six or seven if you include the back before we got on the ice. Okay, we've long been sledging for a long time. So that must be Cerro Margarita. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, definitely. We have been in the tent now for about 40 hours. Uh, getting a little restless, I would say. Personally, I can't speak for everyone. <laughs> I, scraped yes. it, I scraped it clean. Ah. I scraped it clean. <laughs> I can't see what's going on. There we go. Nailed it! By this point, the visibility was zero, and we could just, Riley kind of disappeared into the abyss, and the only way that we knew he was making forward progress was because the rope was going out, and every now and then these big chunks of ice would come down and hit Kieran directly on the head. And Amazing. We were on top of Cerro de Gear. The view was unbelievable. I mean, God, just taking it all in up there. I could see my hand. I could see Huron. Uh, Riley was was there, uh, <laughs> kind of shrouded in cloud. No, we couldn't see a thing. <laughs> but. I was most scared <laughs> when we were, our tent was getting covered in snow. Uh, we had climbed Sarah de Gear and then we had like, we were just getting pummeled with snow and, and near gale winds. And uh, we're just taking turns shoveling. And like right before it was my turn to shovel, there was just like, lightning and thunder <laughs> and we it just kept going and kept going and the snow kept growing and I was like shit I'm gonna have to go out there with a the metal shovel and shovel while uh, the while the lightning is coming down We once again wake up to find ourselves entombed in snow. <laughs> oh, the archaeological dig must begin. That's how we start most days, <laughs> with a tribute to science. <laughs>
sled in the middle of the Neff Glacier. Fully grown 27 year old man, and I almost just pooped my pants. Just wanted to make sure that you guys. That always looked pretty urgent. It was. And the Neff Glacier, like the big glaciers in Patagonia, are these huge long expanses of what we call dry glacier. And dry glacier is when there's no snow on it, it's just bare ice. And when there's just bare ice, it can be, it's never flat. It's never like you're walking on a sheet of ice. It's, in, a, in its best case, a dry glacier is rippled and has small crevasses in it that you just step across. In its worst case, it is like this jumbled nightmare of ice, sometimes like 20 or 30 feet tall between the little jumbles and you're climbing up and down and it's just gonna be a mess. You can travel one mile in an entire day of travel because it gets so broken and messed up. Because of our loads um, and because of the conditions, especially on the back end, I have almost never been so physically challenged. And definitely not in a while. Definitely haven't been physically challenged like that in the last few years. Uh, I think some of those days were definitely top 10, top 5 days, uh, hardest days that I've ever experienced in terms of like physical output. The next day, our pack rafts were waiting for us, and we pack rafted out the Solaire River, which was hilarious. I paddled the venerable craft, the Lagoon Dose, an inflatable kayak for two people on flat water. But after that, it was just a nice meal with Don Ramon's family, and then we caught a couple boat rides back to Puerto Botran and we were back. We were out, kind of shell-shocked from the whole thing, and but psyched. Super psyched we did it. didn't have any weather windows. In like the 22 days we were on the ice, we got one like three hour window of clear skies and then another like eight hour window of clear skies. And everything else was precipitating with zero visibility, <laughs> which is insane. <laughs> but just part of, part of the deal for climbing there, I guess. That's why no one goes there. That's why Sarah de Gear was on climb, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. 
Crystal fountain.